Um, I'd like to make a little cut around tonight. Um, we're going to open this up like I do most of my lectures for class with a joke. And it's going to be one of these lectures where it's perfectly fine if you hear something funny to laugh at it until you're not a 10 and technical difficulties. Now, this is my seven year old's favorite joke that she won't come to me So, if you know the answer to this joke, do not say anything. You know who I'm talking about. Um, give everyone else a chance. So the joke is, you guys ready? All right. The joke is, why did the monkey fall out of the tree? I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, because he was dead. <laughs> I know. This <laughs> so there are a couple of reasons I like telling that joke. Um, the first reason.
this area is developed the most optimal treatments for post traumatic stress disorder. Okay? And if you want to learn more about them, you can visit www.shop.org. Check this plug. We have several uh, treatments. So if you or someone you love uh, are interested in getting treatment, please check out the website. But you don't even have to do that. If you're in the building here tonight, we have a table over by the front door, and my friend Amanda will tell you everything there is to know. Okay? So, let's start at the very beginning. What is PTSD? That's a very simple question, what we think. And if I ask everybody, what is PTSD? People would have definitions, but your definitions don't matter, right? But the definitions that matter are the ones that the psychologists come up with. So the way we define PTSD is post traumatic. Maybe you guys are laughing at this Now I know what we're doing. I'm a nervous guy. Anxiety and fear associated with that experience. And the idea is that in therapy and out of the 
real world, do things to help them experience less anxiety and less fear. And if we can make that fear go down, subsequently the PTSD will go down. Okay? So we're either going to change thoughts for cognitive processing, or we're going to change feelings and emotions for prolonged exposure there. Next slide. I'll wait this Now, we've been increasingly using medications and also using medications in concert with the psychotherapist that I just mentioned. So some of the things we use, we use antidepressants, we use mood stabilizers, we use blood pressure medicines, interestingly, and they actually use some pretty cool things like stop people from having nightmares. We didn't know that would actually happen. Um, and we used to use the anti-anxiety meds, right? Because PTSD used to be categorized as an anxiety disorder. But we don't do that anymore. And it is primarily because the evidence says they don't work that great. And so we don't use things like this bad, bad examex anymore for PTSD. And that's primarily a group because they don't work that well. And so unless someone's really keyed up all the time, we try to avoid that. Now, there's a couple of new drugs out there that some of you guys might have heard of that we're doing active studies on these things in different parts of the world. Um, these things that are on the horizon um, are ketamine and SGB stands for stomach tangling and block. And if you guys have heard of these things, what they do, I think, is fairly interesting, and I think it's they hold a lot of promise. So the thing with people with PTSD, as I said earlier, their threat detection system is going haywire. It's nuts pretty much all the time. So if you sort of make an analogy between the threat detection system in the brain and someone's security alarm at their house, right? People with PTSD, their security system is going off every time their car drives. It's going by every, it's going off every single time the Amazon guy drops a package in the front door. And if you have a spouse that wears packages as much as mine does, you would understand that it's a problem, right? Because there's a guy in our house like 20 times a day. <laughs> now, we want to basically, with these drugs, teach the brain to say, hey, don't go off for the Amazon guy. He's not a threat. We only want the security alarm to go off when? Well, in 
theory, you're going to be sitting there with unattended guys and girls, and hopefully there's someone in there who had a similar experience to you. And you hear someone talking, and you go, you know what made that happen to me too? And theoretically, we hope that people would be more willing to open up if they feel that other people have a shared experience in their own. So, I'm going to show you what we sort of did to sort of examine that tricky data. So, um, hopefully this will work because you guys can see this. Come on, baby. I believe in you. There we go. All right, so this thing is called a waterfall pot. And this is sort of the easiest way to look at individual people's change over time. So we take the people's pre-treatment scores, we subtract the we take the post-treatment scores, and we subtract the pre-treatment scores from them. And every single person on here is, every single line is an individual person. And what you can see is that, I'm going to put these lines here. And one of the things that happens is that the happy I give you a measure of the morning. It's, hey, you're measuring this thing right now. Um, your score might not be the same as you do in the evening because your symptoms are doing different things, right? And so we expect people's scores to bounce around. So before we talk about how much people change and whether that change is important, it was first important to consider what constitutes a meaningful change. Because people are just going to sort of wax and wave throughout the day. And what we sum up as a meaningful change is that this change has to be 10 points. 10 points away from up means a PTA has to be down. If it's worse, 10 points away down means a guy that's even better. Everybody following? Okay. So all of these are individual people who did this treatment. This is most of us to the same. Um, and what you can see is if we look at the people who did individual treatment, oh, a little bit of the wrong way. Okay, if you look at the people who did individual treatment, only three, oh, come on, don't do that. It's a waste time to do that. All right, so if you look at the people who did individual treatment, only five of those people got meaningfully worse over the course of treatment. And sadly, that will actually happen. Some people's scores get worse over the course of treatment. But if you look at group treatment, you can see that more people um, got meaningfully worse over time. And I apologize for the technical difficulties here. Um, but what happened when we look at who got better? And what you see is, when you look at over here for all the people whose scores decreased, about half of them are below that red line and had what we call a clinically meaningful change. As opposed to, for individual treatment, about 80% of those people had a clinically meaningful change. So more people are having meaningful change in the individual group to the group there. And that tells us pretty much all we need to know when we look at this at the group level, because we have to make group level comparisons. So, when we looked at the group level comparisons, what we found was that both treatments resulted in improvements in PTSD, right? So both groups got better. But, when you look at this, it seems like clearly individual treatment worked literally twice as well as, it, sorry, individual worked twice as well as group treatment. And you know, that's not what we sort of wanted. We wanted to show that it worked at least as well. We could have taken a two-point difference. We could have taken like a half-point difference. We did not want a six-point difference, okay? So the take-home message from the very first study that we did on this data, um, it showed that group therapy does in fact work for combat-related PTSD. But it doesn't work as well as individual therapy does. That was the take-home message. And that made us very sad. <laughs> and it made us very sad one, because we spent a lot of money and time on this study. But two, because of the reasons I said earlier, there's lots of reasons why you would want to do group therapy, right? And so this basically tells us group therapy is not going to work well, I'm not going to have as many outcomes. And so, you know, that paper was out for a couple of years, and we sat around, and my buddy Jim Vince and I, and my brother buddy Casey Stroud, and a couple of other people we work with, you know, we're just other pastors. Um, we can't let things go, you know, when we know something isn't right. It bothers us. So this thing bothers us for a long time. <laughs> and so we said, you know, we know for a fact that when we do group therapy for people who um, are rape survivors or natural disaster victims or people who are in car accidents or whatever, group therapy works just as well as for people who have individual therapy. So what gives when it comes to combat PTSD? We can be questioned. It kind of drove us crazy for a little bit. But then we stopped caring because we didn't know. Okay? So now I'm going to tell you a story. So, one day I was working from home, okay? And I don't like to work from home. And I primarily don't like to work from home for a couple of reasons. One, because I have a PlayStation now. <laughs> Two, because there are cookies in there. Three, because when I work from home, I get these terrible headaches, okay? Just awful headaches, and I don't know what it is that drives me. But I was working from home this day, and I had this awful headache. It was just literally a killer. And I get, I get these headaches, and I get them especially on the weekend if I try to work from home. And I don't know why I get these headaches. <laughs>
with keeping up with the conversation. You know, I was mixing up study findings, I was mixing up results, I was telling people stuff that wasn't even on the paper. I was even confusing people at that point. I think I called Pam Reason. I called Pam Reason, who's like a big time fantastic researcher. I call her some like a really close back person, and she probably would have punched me in the face had she been standing there. Go to that company. So anyway, I told him after a while, I said, no, I got to get off this call. This is not working. I just have this headache. I'm, I promise I'm not like this dumb in my life. Um, and so I got off the call. I said, we'll do this again in two weeks. I have all the papers done. There's no like um, But I told him, I'll get him done in the next couple weeks. And so I got off that call. And then I had like a Eureka moment, like two days ago. It didn't happen. They were just like, hey. And that Eureka moment was this. Um, one of the things that happens when people with PTSD, even though it's not a full symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder, is they get what's called post-traumatic headache. And there are a lot of people who actually want to study right now get headaches as well. And I had this thought that other people had in their research too, um, was that I wonder if, if I had this much trouble focusing on the conversation when I had a headache, what would that be like for people doing group therapy if they couldn't keep up with the conversation in the same way? And you sort of have this thought that that might actually account for the fact that group therapy didn't work as well as individual therapy. And so we went back to the literature, right? We started reading some more because reading is fundamental. And we did a lot of reading about what they call mild traumatic brain injury. And mild traumatic brain injury is just a fancy word for concussions, okay? And what we found was, of course, that concussions are fairly prevalent in the general population, of course, 10% of people, but it's more prevalent amongst people in the military. They've had a concussion at least some point in their lives, okay? And that's up to 25%. And I thought this was really low, because I looked around the house, and I have a wife, and I have three daughters, and I did something terrible in my past life. <laughs> and, and what happened, uh, I asked her, I said, have you guys ever had a concussion? And four of the five of us did. And I said, well, okay, well, that should be like 80%. Our house is either weird or everybody else is not. So I wanted to do an unscientific poll tonight. Uh, do me a favor, guys, and raise your hand if you've ever had a concussion at any point in your life. Zoom in on these things, right? I put those 10 points. 
don't change lines in there. What you see is that there's only two people who got anything worse in the traumatic brain injury condition. And for the people who had no traumatic brain injury, only three of them got meaningfully worse. So very few people are getting meaningfully worse in individual therapy, right? What we see in terms of them getting better, oh, there's the phone button, don't go away. What we see in terms of people getting better, the people who have a traumatic brain injury in individual therapy, a lot of them did really well, right? Those scores are going way below zero and they're below that line. And it's actually even more people who went than in the non-TBI condition. And so what we see is individual therapy looks like they did really well overall. And that's because they did really well overall, whether they had a traumatic brain injury or not. Now what do we see when we look on the other side? Those two orange groups, those are people who did individual therapy. What we see when we look at individual therapy, this first group, these are people who had no traumatic brain injury. And if we zoom in on the people who got meaningfully worse, we see there's only three people now who got meaningfully worse over time. And in terms of people who got better, look at that. There's a lot of people who got meaningfully better in group therapy, but only if what? <laughs> if they didn't have a TBI. We're talking about just having a concussion at any point in your life, okay? Now, when we look at people who did have a history of traumatic brain injury, there's three things I want you to see. First of all, look at how evenly they're split. Half the people who got worse and half the people who got better. Those are pretty much equal distributions as opposed to what you see over here. And then when you look at the number of people who got meaningfully worse, um, when you look at the people who got meaningfully worse, what's happening there, right? That's a lot of people. That's like 20 people who got meaningfully worse. Okay, so more people are getting meaningfully worse. And what about the people who are getting better? Well, first of all, come on, come back to the world. When you look at the people who got meaningfully better, right, there's fewer of them, first of all. And when they're getting meaningfully better, look at that bar. What about what do you notice about it? It's short, right? So these people who happen to be getting better, they're still not getting as better as people in these other groups. What do you guys think that means when we look at the group, the you know, overall group effects? I'll show you that slide. We don't have to do What we realized when we looked at the groups, all those people are just averaging together. It's very clear that what? One of these things is not like the other. Exactly, right? And so we put that table of change on here, and what you see is, is that both people in the individual group of treatments, guess what happened to them? They all got a meaningful change. What about the people who had group therapy who had no traumatic brain injury? They got better too. Look at that. What about the people who had a history of head injury? They got a three-point improvement. Now, if you want to take this back to what we found for the first study, if you put those two blue groups together, and that's what we found for the first study, that's a big effect of individual treatment. If you put those two oranges together, what happens? It's somewhere around six, right? And that essentially accounts for why group therapy didn't work as well. And so it's a much more nuanced finding, right? It's what I call aha moment number one. Because what are the clinical implications of this finding, right? So, um, clinical implications of this finding are you can screen for traumatic brain injury with one question. I did it a minute ago, let's do it again. Raise your hand if you've never had a concussion. Guess what, guys? You guys don't get to do group therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't get to do group therapy because we're using the lessons from the past to say that people who do group therapy with a history of head injury, they don't do very well. And so what we're going to do, we're going to introduce you guys to an individual therapist, and you guys can hang out. Your best friend for 12 weeks or six weeks or however long you were doing it. We don't put those people on individual therapy because it makes no sense to do that. They're not going to have a good outcome at all. So I really like I really like reporting this study because it actually answered um, three of my questions about PTSD. It answered who gets better, right? It told us something about the people that get better, but it also told us about when are some of our treatments not as effective as they could be, right? So group therapy is not as effective as it could be bunch of people who have a history of head injury. Make sense? Now, isn't that one of those things that's like, oh no, we can put people who can't keep up with a group conversation in a group therapy. That makes so much sense. But guess what? We didn't know that until we looked at the data. And now we do know that, so what are we going to do? We're going to be smart. We're not going to do that going forward. And so again, you can answer the same question using different questions around using the same data and even using the same analysis. And I think that's a particular cool thing that we did in this first study. So, um, but the first two things that I just showed you guys, we looked at pre-treatment to post-treatment changes. And that's cool, I guess. But people like me and people like my staff buddies, 
We don't get excited about two time points. That's like ridiculous, right? Because when you have two time points, all you can do is graph each person's pre treatment score, graph each person's post treatment score, and connect them in a straight line. And all you can ask is, are there linear patterns of change? And if you, my friend, believe that people go through therapy for PTSD and they just change on a linear fashion, they just go straight down or straight across or straight up, if you believe that, Amazing offer for me. I'm going to sell you. Okay, I'm not even jumping. It's not a jump. There's six minutes. I'm going to sell you a bridge and some amazing beachfront property in the middle of the Sahara Desert for the very, very low price of one billion dollars. <laughs> Why do you guys think I'm 
like you're trying to sell this bridge for me. So that's what I want to do. I want to become a total start. Figure I got the brand, but I'm not going to ever try to become a billionaire rich in academia. Sorry. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I showed you that picture before of the spaghetti plot, I didn't ask you, but I meant to ask you, because, you know, we're doing a lot of talking for you things sometimes. Um, and I said, do you guys see any meaningful patterns? And it's okay if you don't, because you guys don't know what to look for, most of you. Um, but there's a way that we can actually look at this thing using what's called a latent trajectory analysis. And what a latent trajectory analysis does, it takes that data, it takes all those complicated patterns of people changing over time, and it slices it, and it dices it, and it asks other people who have similar patterns of change over time. And I really like this analysis because when it finds those similar patterns, what those things are what we call clinically relevant treatment profiles, and there's some of them that we sort of always expect to see. And I like this analysis, one, because it lets me answer this question about who gets better. So when we realize that, hey, there's four trajectories, or there's five trajectories, we can actually go back and see who are in these trajectories and see what they all have in common. But this thing also allows us to answer questions like, where in the treatment process do improvements occur? And that's a very important question um, that this analysis can get at. And so we were at this so we're going to ask more details. We ran this thing, and what we found was evidence on four distinct treatment profiles. And I'm going to tell you what each of them were, starting from the bottom, working our way up, okay? And so this first one, that's what we call the rapid improvers. And here's what you need to know about rapid improvers. So what we did here, we graphed how much the people changed from baseline at the end of the week on the bottom. So at week one, it's going to look really small, but what I want you to see is at the end of week one for this particular group, they had, on average, a 15-point drop. After two sessions of therapy, these people were basically as good as we would expect them or hope for them to be overall, like five points better than that, because that 10 point drop is what we say is clinically meaningful. What happened to these people later as they progressed? They're rapidly improved, so halfway through treatment by the end of week three, they have a 30 point drop. That's insane for PTSD, right? A lot of people don't go down that far. This was about 20% of our people. Now, after that, right, when you go down as far as you can see, go any further, right? Because no one ever gets down to zero, right? And so what we did, we looked at these people, we said, what do these guys all have in common, right? And what we found was these were younger people. Um, this group, on average, was five years younger than everybody else. So there's something about young people getting better, faster, with PTSD treatment, or at least with time to process it. There's a different paper out there that found different things, and using a different therapy. Um, we have a second group, we call them gradual response. We call them gradual responders, right? Because on average, they kind of look like they have a straight line, right? Well, with these guys, what do we see? Um, pretty much, they get to that 10 point change, somewhere around week three is when they go under that red line. And then by the end of treatment at week six, they have about a 20 point drop. And that 20 point drop, that's pretty good. So we're basically looking at 40% of our sample that has amazing changes. Like if we would take any one of those two groups if we could get everybody in those two. Now, we have this third group. Oh, no, I'm sorry. What we found about that group of the gradual improvers, uh, they were more likely to be people who were in combat arms roles. So they were more likely to be infantrymen, infantrymen than truck drivers. And so we got to explore that a little bit more to figure out why people who have combat roles um, end up in that particular um, trajectory. Um, this third trajectory this is what I call late bloomers. And that was like 40% of our people. And the late bloomers, they were an interesting group for a couple of reasons. I'll show you in a second. When we see with the late bloomers, for the first five weeks of treatment, they only decrease four points. So they go all the way through and pretty much flat until the last week of treatment. And then during that last week of treatment, what happens? They get like a five point drop. So they go from four points down to five points down. And they almost get there so close I can taste it. But what do we do after that six week of treatment? We say, you got your 12 sessions, bud? Sorry, you only got nine points. What do you guys think we should do with that? And then when they started working, we cut them off. And so we're doing other studies to actually look at whether different lengths of treatment matter. And we have to keep, I haven't personally taken that data, but people have. And so we're going to find out if that actually happens overall. Now, this last group is an interesting group. Um, I call these guys the early worsters. Oh, the thing about the late boomers, by the way, um, they had more deployments than other groups, right? So we looked at the number of deployments they had. And I think what that reflects um, is that. 
people come in and all these other research theorems when it's we're ripping a band-aid off of what we do with PTSD treatment, right? And if you just have one trauma, it's just one band-aid to rip off it. So you just start getting better right away. Well, this group, we had a lot of band-aids, right? We started ripping off all these band-aids, and it hurts when we rip band-aids off, right? And I think that's what happened with that particular group. Just that it's not the fact that they had more employments, so as the odds are, they had more traumatic experiences to work through. We always tell people, we're going to work on their worst trauma, but should anyone just work on the one most bothersome trauma? No, they want to talk about all of them, right? And so that's what we saw. Um, this last group, they were called early worsters. And with early worsters, okay, that early worsters group, what happened with these guys was really weird. So they, right out the gate, after the first two sessions of therapy, they got nine points worse. And they pretty much stayed nine points worse all the way through treatment. And that little drop you see at the end, that's between the last treatment session and post treatment. So they actually got better-ish after they stopped treatment. What the hell is that all about, right? Well, um, I think this could be two things. Uh, the thing I actually really think it is, is that when we started with this group, uh, when we looked at them and compared them to other groups, it's kind of different. Uh, what we found was that group had the lowest overall PTSD scores. Their scores were significantly lower than everybody else. And my friend Jim Benson, I'm looking at him now, he's going to smile when I say this, but there's a well-known statistical artifact called regression to the mean. And regression to the mean, what that means is, is that if you take a group of people, who, and you come into three groups, and you say a group is high, medium, and low, and you follow them over time, and even if you don't do anything to them at all, the group that's high, they're going to come down to the average. The group that's low, they're going to come up to average. And I think that's what happened here, because this group, their scores, they had PTSD, but they like just barely had PTSD. And as they started going through therapy, they realized, oh crap, I really do have PTSD. And they just ended up where everybody else was. And I think this is a group that we need to pay a lot more attention to. Now, that was aha moment number two, right? So we found that people improved in meaningfully different but predictable ways. Um, and this has some really cool clinical applications as well. Uh, one of the things that clinicians will tell you that they just know is that clearly treatment response is not a one size fits all kind of you know, thing. Some people are going to get better quickly, some people are going to get you know, better slowly, and some people will get worse, right? Raise your hand if you're a clinician, and you know that fact. Come on, I see clinicians. Only one? Okay. Well, um, what we know though now is that we can predict who's going to be in those groups, right? We can actually say, you look like this, you're probably going to be one of these people, and we can get in front of them. Um, another thing that we learned is that the people who are in that early responder group, uh, rapid responder group, they got better really quickly, and we might as well have stopped three weeks in. We could have just said, you know what? You're already on uh, symptom criteria, your scores are really low, you're not going to get any better. We can just spend three more weeks and we might go to lunch and hang out or whatever, but we don't need to do this therapy anymore because you're about as good as you're going to get. And then the last thing we know is we need to pay a lot of extra attention to those people whose scores go up right at the beginning. So it's okay if they go down some because people are going to go down and they go back up. But if they go up right away, odds are it's going to be hard for them to come back down. Now, um, so where are we now? We've talked about four of those five who went there. Um, address the who, we address the when, we address the why, we address the where. We're going to answer the question that I would pick that I was one of my students, Sarah. Um, the question I would have picked to answer if I had to do so would be what risk and protective factors can we target to reduce changes in PTSD? Now, I'm going to show you guys a little picture, and I do not want you to freak out, okay? I promise you we're not going to freak out. Special students. Okay. Don't forget. So, what the heck is that? If you know, don't say it because you know, don't have to show it. Um, this thing, I'm going to tell you what it is in a minute, but what it really is, is the reason they throw money at me to do data analysis, right? Because I know what that thing does and what it means. It's not just like a schematic of Noah's Ark or some weird thing. No, 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 it's weird. So, before I tell you what that thing is, I want to talk to you a little bit, I'm a professor now, and I'm going to talk to you about what I see as the problem with many of our theories, not just our psychological theories, but all of our theories in all of science. So, the main problem I see that we have is that we have untested assumptions about causality. 
we say, hey, X causes Y, and we come up with a reason why we think X causes Y. We never think, well, you know, maybe Y could cause X too, because the two things are related, yet they're only going one way or the other in terms of what causes what. And part of the reason that we've never really thought about these things in terms of being feedback loops or the thing going the other way is because we haven't had good statistical tools that would allow us to investigate these ideas of reciprocal causation. Fair enough. Now, if you think about something like cognitive processing theory, what does it say? You guys remember what we're on? Cognitive processing theory says change someone's negative cognition, this is self blame, for example, which is one of the things we're talking a lot. If you change the negative cognition, you change the PTSD, and it is a one way street. It cannot go the other way. And if you say it can go the other way, people will throw stuff at you. I've been in conferences where it's happened. <laughs> now, I thought, you know, is this thing really unidirectional? Is it that the uh, you know, PTSD is changed by cognition, and the cognition are changed by PTSD? I don't know. It could be that both of these things are happening at the same time. And the problem is, is that because we have all of these untested assumptions about causality, they won't even let you do it. You can say, hey, advisor, I'm going to test it this kind of feedback. And they go, no, we've been doing cognitive processing therapy for 30 years. Here's what the theory says. You can't go say cognitive processing therapy is wrong. They will throw stuff at you. I've been at conferences and it's happened to me. Right? So that's what happens. But now we don't have to settle for that because now we actually have way cooler tools to help us answer questions. And the model that I showed you a second ago, um, it's really good at helping us answer a very, very particular question that I'm a big fan of, and it is a question as old as time itself. And right now, what would be really cool is this adorable young lady right here would say, Dad, what question is that?
So, <laughs> I'm going I'm to tell you what this model is, okay? And I'm going to try to do it in one breath, but I'm going to do it by reading a sentence that I wrote in the paper, because I want to show you guys the fancy kind of sentences that I wrote. So, <laughs> all right, here we go. So, this thing, you got to turn around and see it. Nope, I want you guys to see it too, because I'm going to read the rest of the sentence. All right, I'm going to look at it right up here. So, this thing is a graphical depiction of a dynamic system of temporal sequential dependencies that produces two simultaneously estimated equations and allows things like a thing construct and a cost construct predictions of change in time over two variables. The two variables are changing. I got to work on Because that's a lot of stuff to say. That's a lot of fancy words. That's a lot of GRE words, right? That's not like grad school words like temporal sequential dependencies. Anybody know what that means? Yeah, exactly. And you should. This is a real fancy way of saying that that is a statistical model. It allows us to take two variables that we think are related and figure out which one is the cause and which one is the effect. And that would have been a much easier sentence to write, right? Now, the great thing about this model is, is that it allows us to answer the question in a cool way. It allows us to say the answer is either, neither, or both. What is that? Those slides I have all clicked in the workshop. It's cool. <laughs> all right, so it's either, neither, or both, which we can actually figure out using this model. And so, I promised you guys I wasn't going to do a lot of statistics, right? I said, I'm not going to show you any F-tests. I'm not going to show you any maximum likelihood estimation and all that kind of stuff that I like to geek out about. Um, and so, I can tell you how this model works, but I have to do that stuff. I have to tell you how it works, and then I have to show you. <laughs> Primarily by going into the about statistics. And you guys know why. That's my students. You guys don't think like, much wrong thing about stats. It's not as fun as this is. I guarantee you. Now, you're going to have to trust them and realize that when we do stats, st stat, look, statistics, that's the word, um, we do magic. And there are often people who say, God, we have some of this come up with that's like crazy, it's like magic. Like that thing when we first show, when we show that, oh, just this one group is stupid and other groups are really awesome, right? And so this thing works by magic, okay? So that's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything about statistics. You just need to know we do magic. And I'm a magician, okay? Because that sounds really cool, right? Well, I'm a magician. And I'm Okay? So, we do magic, but it's not like you pull your thumb off your hand magic, because I was doing that back in like second grade, right? So that's like, that's like multiplication magic. That's not particularly impressive. Um, it's not magic, even like doing some crazy card trick, right? Because, you know, I have kids, my seven-year-old and nine-year-old, they watch YouTube all the time. They can do like every magic trick there is, because guess what? People have ruined everything. <laughs> so they know all the magic tricks. I can't even impress them with any magic like that. What happens is when we do these sensitive models, we go to the dark side, okay? And we go to the dark side, and people often say, What the hell? This stuff that you're doing is like a And I go, Oh, oh, that's thank you. It's cool. You look like that. It's really sort of dark and dangerous stuff. And if you don't know what you're doing, you know, unless you know, like, you know, you're like, Watch the top of the computer, you kind of fall into it and be stuck there. Ones and zeros so, this is sort of dark magic, right? That we're doing. But this is even the darkest magic. So, when I run this particular model, I gotta dig into the deepest, darkest recesses of magic that I can find. Okay? And here's what we come up <laughs> Now, can everybody see that in the back? Alright, for those of you who can't see it or can't see it, um, but that is my other kid. She got the Harry Potter sewing pack for her birthday. And for those of you who don't know what Harry Potter is or what the sort of hat is, shame on you. <laughs> um, for those of you who do know what it is, because you're awesome, right? When you go to Hogwarts on the first day of school, what do they make you do? They make you put on this hat. This hat does this. It actually talks. It's not moves. And in the movie, uh, people put this hat on you and they tell you which of the four houses of um, the school that you're supposed to go into. What's the name of the school? Uh, Hogwarts. There we go. Now, you put this thing on and it says you're in one of these stair schools. And if you want to, you know, have speaking roles in the movie or like the last one, you need to be in either Gryffindor or Slither, right? Because you we know it looks who to two of them. So I put this hat on and I did its thing, and I had that weird face that I'm making right there because this thing told me, well, I do not know I'm not do that. I, I had this look on my face because this thing was like, hey, you are in love. And I said, what? No way. I'm taking a great photo. And if you don't believe me, like, pull your phones out and Google, like, the houses of Hogwarts and look 
Well, actually, I go back to something. Right? I, I do this in class. The students are laughing. Because sometimes I'll just be talking about something, and I'll just go off on a random tangent. And my students look at me and tell them, you guys have to do this when I go on a tangent. Yeah. Throw them and pull out. They got to ruin me back. Okay? It goes in my class, too. Take it. My semester is off. I want you guys to look at a model when we actually have this work, right? So, uh, this paper that we just got published, we looked at where PTSD and self blame were dynamically related to it. Okay? And so, again, cognitive processing therapy, it says you've got to change the conditions, it will change the PTSD, and don't you dare switch those arrows around. If you do, you punch it. So, we ran that fancy model, and what we found um, was that earlier changes in self blame predicted later changes in PTSD. And all my friends who love cognitive processing therapy and the theory that underlies it, they stood up and they started dancing. And I was like, whoa, guys. Get off my desk. This is weird. Okay? Because they got really happy. They were like, in your face, not the hell. We were right. And I said, guys, come down. Come down. This butt. Jeez, that's a big butt. Let's <laughs> 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 go. Influence whether someone gets better or not. But 
now that we have that data, now that we have looked at 6,000 people in strong SARS under screen treatment, we can dive into data and find out what worked and who did it work for. And the beauty of that is we can use those statistics and we can find what worked for people. And that will allow us to create personalized events. Go back to that very that second step, right, where I said, you know what, if you have a concussion, right, we're not going to put you in group therapy. We can do that for people to help them have better outcomes. That's important. Um, and the last thing I hope that you will realize today is that there's only one real reason that I want you to fall out of tree. <laughs> and also that I remember for the rest So, um, before I let you guys get back to the bar, uh, I would like to do a special, couple of special things. Um, I'd like to thank our members of the administration, particularly the Jello, uh, for nominating me out of everyone in the College of Liberal and Fine Arts to uh, give this talk tonight as a representative of our uh, college. Um, there are over 100 talented people in the College of Liberal and Fine Arts. Many of them who are here, and I appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure many of them would have done a good job as well. Um, so I hope that I represent our college uh, decently. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in the College of Strong Star, but particularly Dr. Alan Peterson, who was sort of an engine that makes Strong Star go. Um, Ray and Tony, who are people who do a lot of the data stuff that, um, that helps keep me going, uh, but particularly uh, Dr. Jim Mitz, who is my guy. Um, I got to spend the last four years um, basically going out to talk with Jim every week for you know, four or five hours, and we talk about horses, we talk about dogs, because he has lots of horses and dogs, lots of them. <laughs> um, we talk about our kids, we talk about life, and every now and then we talk about statistics too, and it's really been one of the honors of my career, my pleasure career. To have gotten the training from someone who has literally probably forgotten more about statistics than I know. Um, I'd like to thank the UTSA Department of Psychology, one for training me, because I, I am a student of UTSA, UTSA product, go runners, um, and also the game game job. So that's <laughs> that. <laughs> and then um, I'd like to thank all of our men and women in uniform, especially those who are in attendance, even if they're not in uniform right now, um, especially the ones who participated in this study. Um, they always have sacrificed for our country, and the sacrifices they even made uh, by getting this treatment is something we're going to bring forward. We're going to use what we learned about those people to help soldiers in the future. And I would like to especially um, thank one woman in uniform, um, and I know she's in right now, um, but I'd like to say a special hi to my wife, um, who is currently deployed for her fourth or whatever deployment right now. Um, and so if she's watching, I hope that she. I hope I didn't say go a lot. She made me practice for like two days. She's not saying go. She's not looking at her hands. No curse.
what Dr. Zeus forgot to tell you about computer hackers. And this will represent our very strong cybersecurity program that we just said. So please refer to your programs and the posters that are around for details of the full list of upcoming talks. We will not have a formal question and answer period tonight, but you are welcome to uh, linger, talk with Dr. Hale, and stay with your friend for the refreshments. And he will be here to chat and answer any questions that you have. So thank you again very much for being with us tonight and have a close meeting.